Thank you, guys. And good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Madhu Venugopal, and this is Jana Radhakrishnan. We both represent the Docker networking team. Uh, we both uh, joined Docker as part of the Socket Print acquisition, which happened uh, last year, I guess. Um, so we're going to spend a lot of time doing deep dive into Docker, uh, the new swarm mode. I will start covering the overview of what we have done in 112, and Jana will take over the deep dive. So let's give him a lot of time, not me. Uh, all right. So we will cover a high-level item on what is Lib Network. There will be a lot of confusion on what Lib Network is, what Lib Network must be. But here we are going to cover on what it is, what we are targeting towards uh, achieving, uh, and how uh, multiple projects can actually make use of. And we will spend more time on the 112 features, especially on the Swarm mode, which we keynote, uh, part of the keynote yesterday. On deep dive, Jana will be going through the multi-host networking, secure control plane, data plane, the built-in service discovery, load balancing, routing mesh, so on and so forth. Right? So we'll cover all the details in the 45 minutes that we got. So let's see how much we can cover. So the biggest confusion or the myth that people have today about Lib Network is that, hey, Lib Network should do just the driver part of it. right? Like, for example, uh, uh, do the VLAN stuff or the VXLAN stuff. And you know, let's stop, stop right there. Uh, but networking doesn't work like that, right? Networking stack has the management plane, control plane, and data plane. The drivers actually take care of the data plane pretty well. And that's where we have the plugin interfaces today. All the drivers, like the, ol the overlay driver, the bridge driver, we have Mac VLAN driver now. And there are multiple plugins from the vendor community and even customers write their own plugins, right? Uh, so those plugins really, really work well for the data plane aspect of it. But the, the, uh, the idea of Lib Network is to provide the entire distributed networking stack for Docker to work, right? Regardless of which platform that you run your Docker on, regardless of the infrastructure that you bind your containers to, networking should just work. Uh, it's very similar to what the uh, original Docker's intention is. When you have the applications, uh, once you write an application, it should just work across all platforms, across the cloud, across your data centers, laptops, so on and so forth. The same principle applies to networking as well. So the moment we join Docker, the first thing that Solomon told us is this one, right? Make sure networking is portable. That's the fundamental aspect of this one. So in order to provide the, the portability of the networking stack, we have to provide the, the stack so solid that we don't want to provide, make any holes there where the, the management plane is handled by another component or the control plane handled by another component. Things just break when you move, from, when you move your distributed application from a laptop to, say, a cloud or a, a other infrastructure. So we, we, we really give a lot of importance to make sure the UXs are in place, the control plane is appropriately managed. And when it comes to data plane, yes, we can have a lot of plugins. They can do whatever they want to. For example, there are, we introduced the Mac VLAN uh, driver in this, for this release. You'll start seeing that uh, uh, even the traditional networking folks who are interested in having VLANs, so the people consider containers, some, sometimes people have, want to have containers as VMs, so they would like to plumb uh, VLANs right inside their container space and want to have the IP addresses managed by a DHCP server go inside the container so that they can manage the containers as any other VM kind of a thing, right? So we are providing such functionalities as well now. At the same time, with the exact same networking stack, the control plane, the management plane, we're able to do also the overlay driver. With the same stack, we're able to do the host driver. With the exact same stack, we are doing the bridge driver, right? So any networking, uh, uh, plugins that you know, driver you know, everything goes via the Lib Network networking stack. That's the fundamental thing that we need to understand. So if there are other projects which want to use Lib Network without using this stack, that means they are trying to use this as a, uh, just as a driver interface, which doesn't actually satisfy the Docker's requirement of make the Docker uh, distributed applications completely portable, right? So and that's the fundamental uh, uh, requirement for Lib Network, and that's what we provide. We provide the Docker networking fabric, regardless of where you run the, uh, the, the Docker applications. So Lib Network is a place where we define the content networking model. 
So we have covered this in multiple talks, and today we are not covering that since it's a deep dive. But in a short line, container networking model is a simplistic view of how containers must connect to a given network. So we have the sandboxes, networks, and endpoints, which I think Jana will also cover a little bit on the deep dive. So I will leave it there. We also provide built-in IP address management. So uh, IP address is a big thing, right, of course. Every container have an IP address. So we, if we not to reach another container from a container or from external world, we need an IP address to talk to the container. So we provide a built-in mechanism for IP address management. So actually users can define their subnets, they can pro provide their ranges, assign IP address to containers, so on and so forth. Also it's pluggable, so you can have your own DHCP driver and uh, plumb to your existing DHCP server, so it's going to work. So your DHCP server is going to actually assign IP addresses to your individual containers as well. And we provide native multi-host networking. When you say multi-host networking here, it's two parts, the control plane and the data plane. Data plane, as you said, is managed by the overlay driver, built-in overlay driver, or any other driver that the plugins provide. The control plane today in 112, we have a gossip-based mechanism, which I think Jana will cover. So that, that is common for any, any plugin. So any plugin can actually make use of the control plane, comes out of the box with Librent work, which is highly scalable, secure, because it is, is, we are using the secured uh, surf layer there. So it's secure, encrypted. So, so every single data plane architecture folks are going to implement there, whether it is Mac VLAN, IP VLAN, or whether it is a Contiv plugin, or a OVS plugin, or so on and so forth, everybody can actually make use of the exact same control plane. So the, the stack is completely portable now. That's the whole entire point about this. And also we have the bit, uh, native uh, service discovery using embedded DNS, which we introduced in 1.10 uh, Docker uh, release, and we are uh, enhancing these features on every release. But now in, in 1.12 we have introduced the web-based uh, uh, service discovery as well. And now for the first time in 1.12, Docker has the concept of a service, right? Docker service. So that fits directly into the service discovery aspect here. While in 1.10, 1.11 we are trying to manipulate the service discovery using the containers and aliases and so on and so forth. And we are using the DNS round robin in order to achieve the load balancing. But now with 1.12, uh, the service discovery is plumbed directly into the Docker service top level construct. Uh, and we can provide the web-based uh, load balancing or DNS RR if folks are interested in that. Uh, that's a very powerful integration that we have. And of course, uh, from the get-go, we wanted to make sure batteries are included, but swappable. So that's why we have this uh, plugins, the ecosystem can contribute. So today we have a pluggable system for IPAM, IP address management, and network driver, which is the data plane component of it. Slowly we will start expanding it to other components as well, like service discovery and you know, load balancing and so on and so forth. So today we can do some sort of load balancing through a kind of a plugin architecture which we'll cover on how we can use Nginx or HA proxy instead of the built-in IPVS mechanism. This is possible even today, which I think we'll cover uh, in, in, late in the talk. Again, what CNM provides? CNM provides, CNM is cluster aware now. Thanks to the, uh, the new Docker swarm mode features, it is cluster aware, and hence, Lib Network can actually make use of the cluster awareness. So now CNM provides multi-host networking without any KV store requirement. So in, in 1.9 to, till 1.9 to 1.11, we were using the external KV store in order to provide the clustering kind of a concept in Docker. But now with the swarm mode, we don't need external KV store anymore. It just work out of the box seamlessly. So all networking will just work naturally really now. Uh, and we have the, with 1.12 we introduced encrypted data plane and control plane. So your overlay traffic is encrypted end to end. The VXLAN is encrypted to VXLAN. And also the control plane where we exchange the route, routing information, like which container, what is the IP address, what is the MAC address, how to reach them, they're all in, in an encrypted channel today. And of course, service discovery load balancing, as we said. And we also, also have the routing mesh. Routing mesh is a really cool concept that we introduced in 1.12, right? That, it provides the mechanism where a container can be anywhere in, this, in, the, in the cluster, 
in this form cluster. And even traffic that is asked to reach that container from externally can hit any of the nodes in the swarm cluster, and traffic will be routed to it appropriately. That's a pretty powerful one, which Jenna will go deeper into it. And of course, it's really, really scalable, and it's completely decentralized. There's no more centralized anything. There's no centralized data store. There's no centralized SDN controller. There's no centralized anything, really. Everything is distributed, decentralized. That makes it really, really scalable and very powerful from a construction point as well. So among all this cool feature that we added in Swarm mode, I wanted to make sure that we didn't uh, lose out on one more important thing that we added, which is the Mac VLAN driver. So this Mac VLAN driver is a very interesting concept where, uh, so we are all, uh, it's, it's a dopamine, right? Like the, having this uh, uh, multi-host networking and it's, it's really, really cool technology. We just want to do it. But there are you know, brownfield operations, right, where folks wanted to move from, hey, you know what, I have my existing workload, I cannot just move to this the new features, can you help me with, uh, you know, uh, with my, my, I have an existing VLAN in my network, I want to plumb the VLAN into it so that I can, my, my uh, network operators can manage it the way they manage the existing workloads, and slowly we'll migrate to the new architecture so that, you know, things, things are usable. So Mac VLAN driver actually helps with that. So we introduced that in 111 as an experimental feature. Now there are, with a lot of testing and a lot of feedback, we actually exiting the, the experimental feature for Mac VLAN at this point. So what it provides is it integrates directly into the underlay. So we can actually have your VLANs in the underlay, and you can create networks in the Docker side. Let me go to the next command. Command will be simpler to explain. So if you want to create a Mac VLAN network, it's as simple as the same Mac, same management plane of Docker networking. Just say Docker network create with the driver Mac VLAN. Provide the subnet that you really want to use. So if you have an existing subnet in your, in your uh, so in this case, I'm using a built-in IPAM driver, which doesn't know about the underlay subnets. So the, here, the operator is helping the IPAM driver learn this fact that, hey, there's an existing subnet called 192.168.16, but among that, I'm going to give you only the 192.168.41.x24 to use for the containers. The rest are managed for some other workloads. And then you can reserve some IP addresses saying, hey, don't use this IP address because it could be a gateway IP address or an E0 IP address or whatnot. You can reserve them using the aux address. It's all available today in, uh, in the 111 as well. And provide the gateway and, and specify which, what is the parent interface there. Since back VLAN is an underlay integration, we specify which interface is what you, are, uh, is you want to plumb your, uh, your containers to. Here, the dot 41 is the VLAN. It's the convention in uh, Linux networking. When you say E0.41, the 41 is the VLAN address, the, the, the VLAN space. So once you, once you create a network like this, the rest, the Mac VLAN driver takes care of it. After that, Creating and running a container is exactly the same as any other running containers. Just, just start running as Docker run the Mac VLAN network, and pretty much that's it. Uh, now you get a Mac VLAN plumbed uh, network where you can have containers launched on this network that will actually be plumbed directly to the underlay. Meaning this will be the, if, you, if you're looking for the highest performance, this will be the highest performance networking that you will see in the, in the networking uh, stack that we have today. Because there's no more, in this case, there's no natting or port mapping. None of them exist. It's directly underlay integrated into the, into the containers. Right? Um, again, Mac VLAN driver, we just wrote the driver interface. We make use of the Mac VLAN actual driver in the kernel. So Linux kernel supports Mac VLAN from 3.2, I think, if I'm not wrong. So, it's pretty, uh, it's been very, it's a, it's a battle tested code, and it works really, really well. So those who are interested in doing the underlay plumbing, Mac VLAN, please check it out. And with that, let's go deep dive, and Jenna, take over. Um, hey, good afternoon. Um, ready for deep dive on 112 features? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, um, so networking, um, especially multi-host networking, has undergone um, uh, a few significant changes uh, from what you saw in 110, 111, 19, 110, 111, and things like that, um, because uh, we have a 
a new way to form clusters. Um, Swarm cluster is actually a native inbuilt cluster management system that uh, we, have, we have in 112. And that actually kind of simplifies a lot of problems for, for us. It improves performance while creating networks for IP address allocation, um, a lot of other things like that. Uh, earlier, we were actually relying on an ex external KV store. Uh, the one thing that I want to say right now is in swarm mode, you can actually form overlay multi-host network, networks without an external KV store. Right? You don't actually need another external KV store with a cluster store option and things like that. All of those uh, state is uh, getting managed by, this, uh, by, the, by, the, by Docker swarm itself. Um, and uh, we'll just talk a little bit more about uh, how in detail that actually happens. So, um, so basically, you know, uh, the managers, the manager nodes, I mean, Swarm is formed out of like, you know, a cluster of nodes. Some of them are manager nodes, some of them are uh, worker nodes. The manager nodes are the ones which actually manage state. Um, and we, are, we actually have a implementation of Raft actually um, running over there. Um, so what's the difference between uh, the Raft implementation that we have in uh, the manager and the one that we actually used in the external KV store? Um, it is a lot more efficient. Of course, you know, Raft itself will have some network latencies because it's a Raft actually, right? You have to kind of get consensus. You have to agree upon, you know, you know your state and things like that. So that actually needs to happen, whether you have an external KV store or whether you have um, your own embedded Raft store. But you don't actually incur the network latency of trying to create a network from a completely decentralized um, sort of host that we actually did in, in older models. Actually, earlier, you could actually hit any, any Docker engine in the cluster, and you can actually create a network. It will have to go to a KV store, allocate the IP address, allocate the subnets, and then it will return. And every time that you have to do something about the network, like creating a network, creating a container, or um, connecting another network into the container, or you know, removing a container, stopping a container, for example, all those kind of things have to go to the KV store. There is significant network latency over there. Uh, and we have to do like, frequent round trips like that. Uh, that's, that's one of the uh, you know, problems that we want to solve when we actually move to uh, uh, the native swarm cluster. Here, all of those kind of things don't need to happen. Just that when you're actually having decided what your state is, then you actually commit it to the raft. Then the raft actually makes sure that the consensus uh, is uh, achieved, and then you, you commit that state. So how does that work? Um, so when you actually create a Docker network using overlay, um, it basically goes to the manager. And uh, we have a component. We have a, a, the, the manager is made up of multiple pipeline stages. One of them is the allocator. Allocator basically takes the network creation request, and, and it chooses a particular predefined subnet that's available um, if you didn't provide any subnet. If it, it provides a subnet, then it will try to allocate that subnet. And the allocation happen in memory right away in that host without any overhead in trying to do that actually over a network and things like that. So once the network is allocated, uh, now you want to create a service, actually. And you want to connect that service to that network. Let's say you create a service, and you say, hey, I want to connect to this, to this network. Um, when you create a service, of course, orchestrator is involved. It's trying to generate you know, uh, the requested number of tasks for that. It's trying to achieve the desired state for that service. Uh, and it does that. But the tasks need IP addresses. Tasks are nothing but, you know, finally, at the end of the day, they are containers. So they need IP addresses. So the allocation of those IP addresses, again, happens um, in that manager. Um, and of course, once the allocation is done, the task gets created, and uh, the uh, state is actually committed into the RAF store. So if, it, if you look at it, once the allocation is completed, only then the scheduler will be able to um, move that particular task into an assigned state, and which will actually be get dispatched into the into the into one of those workers. Of course, manager can also be a worker. So, um, so if you see um, if you see if you, if you if you tried you know Docker service create and uh, if you've looked at uh, the tasks and their state and stuff like that, um, if the task hasn't moved to allocated state, there are you know tasks go through a, a few states: new, allocated, um, assigned, and things like that. So if the task hasn't moved to allocated it is not going to be scheduled, actually. Um, so that is, that, is a, that is a key differentiation between you know, what, we do, what we're doing before and how we are doing things now. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, it, it actually kind of improves uh, the overall um, allocation 
cycle basically for uh, for resources for the IP address. Not only that, I mean, when we say network allocation, it's not just IP address allocation. If you want to actually allocate any resources for you know for the driver, like for example, take overlay. Overlay needs VXLAN IDs basically. Uh, those needs to be globally allocated. We need to actually make sure that no no two overlay drivers actually overlay networks use the same VXLAN ID and things like that. So we make sure that those allocations also happen uh, in a seamless fashion. So in future, if there are going to be plugins that want to actually use the same mechanism, they just need to you know, implement a couple of APIs, and they're done. Their state is getting managed in the RAF store automatically, right? Um, they don't need to actually like kind of even need to interact with the RAF store. It's all like seamless. So that is one part of it. That's what happens in the manager. So we kind of keep the allocation of resources in a centralized manner because we want to kind of achieve consistency, uh, consensus. Um, and for consensus, if you, you want to, for, for having a good, uh, highly efficient, optimized consensus uh, protocol, just want to kind of do that in a centralized manner. So that is centralized. Now, there's a lot of things that happens which needs to be decentralized, actually. Uh, once you actually dispatch the task into the engine, um, you might want to know the you might want to know pretty quickly when a task goes away, so that you can actually remove the routing information of that task uh, in the network. So when you actually like deploy tasks across uh, you know multiple nodes and things like that, we automatically take care of that using a network control plane. We'll talk a little bit more about network control plane later, but what it does is it actually um, pretty rapidly converges uh, on the reachability information of these containers. So so that each and every container can should be able to reach the other container without uh, uh, without too much trouble. I mean, too much stale uh, information and things like that. So that that is what makes the whole thing scalable. So we will talk a little bit more about the um, uh, the network control plane uh, uh, in a moment. Okay. So this is what it is. Um, okay, so in 112, we have uh, introduced a pretty brand new network control plane. Uh, what is a control plane, right? I mean, control plane is, is a term that is being used um, in many different ways in many different contexts. But of course, if you actually have networking background, you know what exactly control plane means, which is basically all the routing protocols, BGP, OSPF, or anything like that, actually. Um, we we don't use BGP or we don't use any other standard routing protocols. The reason for that is um, BGP is a, a very highly scalable protocol. It can scale to like you know a lot more number of uh, endpoints and uh, uh, reachability information, routes, and things like that. But it won't converge quickly. Uh, containers in this model, when we are talking about containers in the service creation model, where tasks are getting allocated and uh, scheduled and uh, being run in, in different nodes pretty rapidly. Uh, you want to converge to the reachability information uh, pretty rapidly as well. Um, sometimes things change more dynamically than, than what you believe in, in, in a pretty static environment, in an underlay network, and things like that. So to kind of solve those kind of problems, we actually use a gossip protocol. Uh, it is based off a research paper called SWIM. And uh, um, it is actually an infectious protocol, basically, which tries to uh, randomly pick up three neighbors and tries to propagate the same information again and again. And because it's trying to do that m to more than one number of nodes, it basically kind of in, you know, uh, acts in a very infectious way so that the whole cluster knows about particular information pretty quickly. Now, we don't want all kinds of information to be broadcasted across the cluster all the time. Um, because you know, all, the, all, the all the nodes in the cluster, they don't need to know everything, actually. Uh, the reason is that uh, we don't need to know about containers which are running on multiple different networks uh, in a node which is not participating in that network. So, so what we kind of have done is that we have scoped the broadcast, actually. So there's something called network scoped gossip, actually. So I mean, again, all these things are you know, building on top of that uh, container network model framework. right? Network is your reference. So everything actually you do you try to do on, the, on top of that reference abstraction, which is network. So uh, what we try to do is uh, we try to scope the gossip uh, on a per network basis. Let's say in this particular example, we have you know, workers uh, W1, W2, W3, W4, W5, 
Um, looks like there are multiple networks actually over there. So this is the, the, the inner circles actually are showing those uh, multiple networks. Um, looks like um, W1, W2, W3 is actually participating in one network. Again, W1 is participating in another network, but there are other nodes actually also participating in W4 and W5 participating in other networks. Um, so when you actually start a container or a service in a particular network, and let's say that's scheduled to a, um, a worker like W1, um, it will try to exchange that information only with other worker nodes which are also participating in the same network. It won't try to you know, broadcast that uh, gossip to, uh, to all the nodes in the cluster. Um, this is actually an optimization to reduce network traffic. Even, even, even though the network traffic is not, not a lot, you probably don't want to do um, unnecessary network, um, network usage uh, just for you know, broadcasting something which you don't want to, actually. Uh, and also, that's, that's, the, that's, that's, that's basically optimizing your network utilization. But also, it actually you know, converges pretty quickly. So if you have only a small set of nodes where you want to gossip, then your convergence is, uh, is much better. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that you can't have a network which actually every node participates. It is possible. That's why we chose Gossip, because in Gossip, you could actually um, scale your cluster to you know, any number of nodes. 10,000, 100,000, it doesn't matter. The reason is because the protocol itself is not trying to reach out to all the nodes, actually, at the same time. It is trying to infect this information across all these nodes um, in a gradual manner. Okay. So that, that actually provides fast, fast convergence. Um, so is it, is it secure? Yeah, it is secure by default. Um, we basically use um, the, the swarm management system itself to do key exchange. So we don't actually try to um, do, you know, do, uh, implement a separate protocol to do uh, key exchange over that. So we actually kind of have a secure, uh, authenticated um, cluster discovery model right now. And uh, that is actually used to exchange the keys that are needed, basically, the symmetric keys that are needed uh, to uh, exchange information in this control plane. So that is actually on by default, and it is out of the box. And <clears throat> it actually also supports periodic rotation. So you know, even if your key is compromised, your keys can be rotated quickly, and then uh, you will actually be able to um, uh, find out the node which is actually um, uh, using uh, or, or a compromise or something like that, and you can take that node out. So that is possible. So because because we are using uh, uh, gossip, I mean, we talked about it. It's scalable. Okay. So that is network control plane. So so we are also um, doing in this release in 112. We also have secure data plane, meaning um, it's this is not this is not a this is not a feature which is enabled by default because you don't need to enable it by default um, for any network or any network path, because you know, if you're running in a trusted network, network environment, you don't really need to secure the data plane. But if you're actually trying to cross an untrusted domain, um, like for example, from your enterprise to the public cloud, or from one public cloud to the another public cloud, you might want to secure that connection between, um, that actually crosses those boundaries and things like that. So you could actually choose when you want to use the secure data plane uh, and when not to, because it has a little bit more overhead and it's not needed when you are actually really running um, um, in, in a trusted domain. Or your, your application is providing its own you know, secure layer, basically. If that's the case, then you don't need to do that, actually. But it is something that will be needed for application, legacy applications, which, which assumed earlier that they are actually running in a trusted domain, and they just assumed that you know, things are going to work. But now you're going to try to move those applications to multiple inf different infrastructures and stuff like that. And you want to kind of make sure that your network path is secure. So that's what we do. So what do we do? What do we, how do we do it? Uh, we use um, kernels IPsec modules to do that. Um, but we don't actually try to create a full mesh of tunnels across all the nodes and things like that. We just uh, make, sure, make, make those uh, tunnel plumbing happen on demand. Whenever a container joins a particular node, and let's say that con container is joining a secure network, and let's say there is another node which is also joining the same secure network, uh, an automatic IPsec tunnel gets plumbed automatically. Um, and let's say if there are multiple uh, secure networks which are trying to share the same node pairs, then they will share the same um, IPsec private channel. So, um, so that's, that's, all, uh, that's all inbuilt. And uh, again, the key exchange for all these things actually, I mean, even though we use IPsec, we don't use anything like Ike or anything like that. 
to do the key exchange because it's it's more complicated. You have much more diff, uh, you know other dependencies and things like that. We do again the key exchange again the, the, the same kind of model as, as what we talked about for the secure control plane. Um, again, key rotations happen, and also this secure data plane is much much more performant because it's all happening in the kernel. Um, the only overhead is really the the, the overhead in uh, encryption and encapsulation, um, which you have to kind of take a hit if you have to secure your network, actually. That is, there is no way around it. Okay, so, again, service discovery, uh, as Madhu talked about that, I mean, we had an implementation of a DNS from 1.10 onwards, basically. Um, so so what, what, are we, what, are we, what are we saying about service discovery in this, uh, in, in, in 112, is that, we discover the services, the service, you know, the services that you create through uh, service create command by default. Um, there are uh, multiple uh, different schemas that are available. There are going to be documentations about that. But when you hit a service, uh, when you try to do a DNS request on the service name, you actually um, get uh, responded with uh, the virtual IP of that service. That's the default. Uh, but you can change it. If you have an endpoint uh, resolution mode, which is configured to DNS RR, you will actually be resolved to the multiple layer records of the actual backend instance containers that uh, that basically are providing the service, right? So, so those two, those two methods are available uh, for a typical load balancing case. You would actually use a, a WIP-based model, and so your DNS is actually going to resolve to that WIP. Uh, but if you really want to do your own load balancing and you can actually like solve the DNS caching problem yourselves and things like that, you could actually use DNS RR and that will just work. So you can just modify how you want to load balance, how you want to you know, choose a particular backend, things like that. Um, how do you do embedded DNS, right? I mean, the one thing about DNS is that, or the service discovery itself, is that it is, it is coped within a network. Again, if you think about it, Again, you know, content network model kind of is the reference for all these things. So the network is the scope of your discoverability, actually. So why do we do that? Um, one of the reasons why we do this is to make sure that your applications are portable. I mean, this may be something that, okay, what, what, what is that actually, right? Um, the way we make applications portable is to, to allow or enable discover, discovering of those services using their unqualified names. Like, let's say you have a Redis application, and let's say that you have a client, and you kind of combine all these two things into a single application or put them in the same network. Uh, now, if you define your application and code your application in such a way that you are trying to reach the Redis service using the name Redis, it will always result to that name Redis, basically, because that Redis service is actually part of your network. Uh, you don't need to actually kind of, in the application, try to um, resolve this, this service using a fully qualified name, uh, because the fully qualified name is not going to be portable. So your application is not portable because of that. Um, so when you write your application during the compile time, you can try to resolve a particular uh, service using its unqualified name, which is not going to change. Uh, and then if you define your uh, you know, application bundle or something like that, which, which is coming in the future, it will actually make sure that this service, these service, set of services are connected to the same network, which means your application, the, the, the bundle file is completely portable, so you can take it to any infrastructure it will exactly dissolve to your whatever service you're looking for. Now, how do you achieve that? I mean, unqualified, trying to resolve to unqualified name is not trivial. Uh, so we, the reason is that we need to know the context. When you're, trying to, when you're getting a request uh, from DNS, uh, from a resolver, uh, for a particular unqualified name, you need to understand, OK, from which network is this coming from, right? I mean, how do we know that? Right? From a DNS server point of view, how do you know that from which network this is coming from? So the way we do it is that we, we have the DNS server embedded in, uh, in Docker itself. But one trick that we play is that uh, we actually open a listener inside the container itself. So when the DNS request is generated by the container, um, it is actually redirected to, so there is, there is a set of IP table tools. If you go into the container, any container which is actually providing service discovery, and if you, if you dump the IP table tools, you will see that uh, there is the, first of all, if you look at the etc.resolve.conf, you will see that the name server entry is like some weird entry, which is 127.0.0.11. Um, so when the resolver is trying to resolve, it will try to resolve to 127.0.0.11. And we trap that request. It's, not, it's just a loopback address, so it's not going to be getting routed or anything like that. Um, so we trap that request, 
and we send it to a particular random D, you know, UDP port that we are UDP and TCP port we are listening um, in, the D, in, the, in the Docker daemon. Of course, for doing that, the socket has to be created inside that namespace. So we just do that. We create the socket inside the namespace and um, we forward that request into the socket. So when the DNS server in the daemon actually gets the request, because it is coming through the socket, it knows that this is coming from this network, um, this container and this network. So it actually knows the whole context of where this request is coming from. Once it knows the context, it can actually generate the appropriate DNS response. Okay. Okay, so internal load balancer. Uh, this is something that we have introduced uh, in uh, 112. Um, so there are a lot of you know, confusion about you know, how this is achieved and things like that. There is uh, one thing that I want to say before even talking about internal load balancer is that, yeah, we actually use service discovery and DNS specifically to resolve a particular service to a virtual IP, but your virtual IP is not going to change. When you create a service, and by default, when you create a service, it gets allocated a virtual IP. Whether you uh, do service update, a rolling update, or anything like that, your virtual IP doesn't change. Even if your resolvers are like caching and it's not like you know following uh, protocols and conforming to protocols, it will actually be. It doesn't matter because your virtual IP doesn't change. Your backends don't change. Uh, that is not true for you know if you're trying to do DNS RR. Um, okay, so so that's why DNS RR is a poor man load balancing protocol but it'll, it'll miserably fail in implementations like Java where it doesn't exactly conform to uh, uh, you know, uh, the TTLs, actually. We basically, when we, even if we do DNS RR, the TTLs, we actually set the TTL to zero, but you know, there are several implementations out in the world which just ignores any, any kind of you know, TTLs and things like that, and will just cache all those kind of things. So, so that's why you know, it's, not very, it's not controllable to you know, find a good, um, uh, Solution where you can you can use DNS RR as as uh, as a general solution for load balancing. Right. That's why we kind of implemented this virtual IP based load balancing. The way we do it is again we actually leverage um, uh, a component or subsystem in kernel called IPVS. Um, IPVS is a pretty battle hardened system which has been there from 2004. It's been used for a while, but the way we use it is a little bit different basically. That's, that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, again, our network control plane is actually. Uh, doing a lot of stuff in trying to converge this state because you have to basically um, propagate the information about the backends to every container which is participating in the network. So let's look at this diagram. Um, that is a network control plane, which learns state, of course. Um, but, okay, so there, there are task one and task two, task three of service A, which form the part of the service. And there, is, there are two clients, actually, which are also, so this, this dashed circle that we have, that is the network. So the service belongs to that network. And, uh, and there are two client applications which are also part of the network. Now what we do is basically um, we plumb um, a load balancer instance in every container which participates in the network. It's not just one, there is no single load balancer that is, which is sitting there somewhere just trying to load balance stuff. There is a load balancer instance that is plumbed in every controller instance, container instance. Um, so that makes, uh, the reason why we do it is actually to make the load balancer highly available. Even if you have um, a lot of, uh, you know, you know it, it doesn't matter whether you have, um, you have one container or multiple containers or something like that, there is an instance of load balancer actually right, right there. So if the container needs the load balancer, it has it. If the container is going down, of course you don't have the load balancer, but that's okay because you, know, you don't need it at that point. Um, so what we do is um, we basically uh, I'm going to you know, go into a demo and talk about how this actually is achieved in, in low-level details and things like that. But the load balancer instance itself is, is, is basically based on you know, a request getting generated on that virtual IP, which is getting trapped by, the, uh, by a set of IP table rules. And then um, uh, an IPVS uh, service is created for that, and which actually kind of does the load balancing for that, which takes, it chooses a particular backend of the service and then forwards the request to that. Um, Okay, so we're running out of time. So uh, I'm going, just going to um, talk a little bit more about um, the routing mesh as well. The route, what is routing mesh? Routing mesh is, is also a load balancer, but it actually is trying to load balance, um, load balance the uh, traffic that is coming from external to the cluster. Meaning if you have a service which 
you want to expose to the outside world and you still want a load balance that service, you would want to use a routing mesh. I mean, how do you use a routing mesh? You don't need to do anything else other than exposing a set of ports, right? That's all you have to do. And routing mesh actually takes care of attaching your um, containers and services into that network. Um, the, the routing mesh actually uses the same mechanism as we talked about for um, uh, the internal load balancing. The only thing that it does is it aut automatically connects the workers also into that network. That is, that, is, that is something called an ingress network that is actually created inside the, uh, for the whole cluster. So this is the routing mesh. I mean, whatever you, you've heard about routing mesh, this is actually the routing mesh, which is basically um, yet another network which, which f in which all the services which are publishing and exposing a port um, actually are participating, and also the nodes in the cluster are participating. Um, what happens is you actually get a published port for that. Uh, for every service that you create and you expose a port, for every port that you expose, you also get a published port. You either can define it yourself or you, you will get allocated one. Um, so as long as you have that published port, as long as the connection request is hitting that public port, uh, the worker will trap that public port and will redirect to the container port. Once the redirection happens, the, um, again, there are a set of IP table rules inside, inside the worker, which actually like, matches and traps those packets, and then um, you know, points to the right load balancer instance for that. So in this particular case, the worker is actually having multiple load balancer instances, each one for each, each and every service, basically. So then it forwards the traffic to the right service. So that's why this particular um, set of load balancer instances are available in all the nodes. That's why when you hit the same port in any node, it just works. Um, okay. So, okay, so I'm done with the talk, but let's do a demo. Um, this, is not, this is not a voting app demo, forgive me, but uh, we'll, do, um, uh, we'll do a very low-level demo, actually. Um, I'm going to join uh, these instances into a cluster. So I'm just joining, you know, three nodes into the cluster. So you'll see that um, you know we have three nodes. They form the cluster. Uh, so the way we do uh, the ingress load balancing, I'm just going to show you how we do ingress load balancing. Um, so you'll see that uh, there are you know var run Docker NetNS is where we actually keep our sandboxes. So there is like two of those actually there. I mean the one with uh, with an iPhone in it actually, which is this one, is really the uh, sandbox used for the overlay network itself. Uh, we don't need to worry about that. This is really the sandbox which is used for the ingress routing mesh. Um, so this is actually a pretty critical um, component of the whole thing, and I'll explain why that is. But before that, I will we'll just check the IP table rules inside the host. Uh, so, okay, so... There is not much. So there is, a, there is not much in it. There is a, so pay attention to this Docker ingress chain. So this is, a, this is, a, this is actually a, an IP tables chain that we kind of create for, uh, provide, for managing all the uh, port forwarding rules for the ingress routing mesh, basically. So, okay, so we haven't done anything now. So let's create a service. Um, so Docker service create. Just really quick so that everybody is aware of time. Uh, in five minutes, we've got the general session starting uh, with general hacks. Uh, you're welcome to stay here and see uh, the demo go through and, and finish. Uh, but if you want to see it, go to the general session. That's starting in five minutes in the same place where the keynote took place this morning. Thank you. Again, you're welcome to stay and, and see the, the demo if you were interested in that. Okay, I'm just going to start this uh, service. Um, I'm still here. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so if you see, I mean, we actually created a service with uh, port 8080 as the published port and the, I mean, the container port as 80. Um, that's uh, that's okay. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to show the load balancing application itself actually because that actually works. So, I'm just going to show how this actually gets plumbed, right? Uh, so, we actually have a put, for, put forwarding rule for any packet that's coming on 8080, uh, plumb it, and, uh, sorry, forward it into uh, an instance that the sandbox instance that is running inside uh, a sandbox actually. It's kind of a sandbox, it's not a container. There is no application running inside that. It's just a network namespace that got, that got created basically. Uh, and it's listening on you know, uh, 172.19.02 IP address and 8080. Uh, once we have that, so let's, let's look at what is happening inside the sandbox, right? Um, so I'm going to use a tool called NSenter, which you can use to get into uh, any na namespace uh, and do uh, look at the uh, state of that namespace. Um, I'm going to actually look at that uh, namespace. So this is the sandbox that we talked about. So I'm just going to go inside that. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to look at what we've done over there, right? OK, I'm going to SC2 first because the path is missing, but it's there. Uh, Okay. It looks like Mount NS Center is actually missing, so I'm going to use a different technique. <laughs> no, it's extra one. Oh, okay. I think it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why. Okay, so we are inside that sandbox. Okay, so you would see that uh, the sandbox, uh, yeah, yeah, it's okay. So I need to do one more command. OK, so we are inside this sandbox. So you would see that you know, the same IP address that we saw earlier, it's over here. Um, so I'm going to show you some, some things that happens here, which actually kind of explains the whole thing. Uh, OK, so the first thing that happens is that there is a redirect read rule, actually. So you saw the packet coming in 8080. It gets redirected to port 80. Okay, that's our container port that we just declared, actually. So that thing happens. Once that happens, um, there is also uh, a mangled rule. So in the mangled rule, in the pre-routing chain, you would see that anything coming on port 880, it should be marked with firewall mark of 256. So these two things are critical. Once we have this information, um, 
So if you do IPS ADM and uh, look at it, you would see that the firewall, so the service is created with firewall markup 256, which is basically the 0x100, and you would see that um, the IP addresses of all the containers actually are being you know, um, added as the backend for those kind of things, for, those, for that service. So this is how the IPv6 addresses are actually cleared. The only other thing that needs to happen is that if you go back to the IP, table, uh, IP tables NAT rule, uh, we actually have to create um, um, a source NAT entry, basically. The source NAT entry created is uh, uh, to make sure that the IPvS masquerades the packet and also like, uh, changes the source IP to the IP that is, that, is, uh, that is the ingress sandbox IP. The reason for that is the packet has to come back to the ingress sandbox before it gets translated and you know, forward to the original um, source requester. The reason for that is that we did masquerading. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing, we changed the port. We changed the port from 8080 to 80. So all those things have to be changed. So we get back the packet and we change back to the original request and then it gets back to the source. So that is how Ingress routing mesh actually works. Okay. Any questions? Uh, mount trick is, uh, you can actually use IP NetNS to um, use a standard path called var run NetNS. So you just need to mount your sandbox into that path. Then IP NetNS works, because NS and NetNS didn't work. <laughs> That's the reason. Okay. The, yeah, the Go ahead. If you have questions, if you can please line up on the microphones. There's two microphones, one on each side. Thank you. Hi, is it possible to attach a container to a specific NIC? <laughs> I know, I don't. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, is it possible to attach a container to a specific NIC so that all of the traffic goes out through that one network interface? Uh, I'm not able to hear you at all. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Is it possible to attach a container to a specific NIC so that all of the traffic for that container goes out through that network interface? Um, you want to attach to a particular network interface? You mean a host network interface? Yes, I've got you know a host that has multiple Ethernet cards in it, and I want to make sure. Oh, you are having multiple? Yeah, I think that is something that actually has come up as a request before. Yeah, we are thinking about it. So basically, yeah, instead of bind mounting or, or listening on every port, every interface. You could actually kind of yeah, stick to a particular um, host NIC, yeah. But it's not there in 112, but it might come in the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I want, thank you for the um, talk, it was very good. Can you um, put this up online, the whole walkthrough that you were doing? It would be really helpful. Yeah, let me try that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. What happens to the ecosystem plugins like Calico, Flannel, Weave, etc.? Uh, I think uh, you know the plugin support for the new swarm mode is not available in 112, but you know it was just because we didn't have time to do that. But 113, we will actually kind of add support for any external plugin. So any multi-host networking driver should be able to use that, and the load balancing and uh, service and everything is just going to work for any driver. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, there's a question about the uh, routing mesh over here. Um, is it correct that you are not doing layer three uh, IP routing? You are doing the, uh, some sort of like a global uh, traffic management versus uh, local traffic management. You are not doing any routing at all. Is that correct understanding? There is, uh, there is no routing actually happening. I mean, routing is happening, but the routing is happening from, so you translate the packet to, um, so you saw the source NAT and destination NAT are actually happening inside the ingress sandbox, right? So that is basically translating the packet into a different layer to network, like 10.255 something, right? So once that happens, the routing happens from that in that network. So that's why we call it routing mesh. So if that's the case, do you support any routing protocol? Like uh, you mentioned earlier, you said you don't support it. Can you, can you explain it? Oh, the routing protocols. You're talking about routing protocols as a control plane? E anywhere, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we don't use any routing protocols because it doesn't converge faster. That's the reason. I mean, even BGP, it's scalable, but it doesn't converge faster for our requirements. 
Okay. Is okay. that is that the answer? Is that the question that you were asking? No, I guess I just try to figure out if there's a case. How can you try to exchange route with let's say appliance? You have a a real like a router sitting somewhere over here. Right, I have a bare metal need to talk to container. I need to understand the routing protocol for the, uh, your control plane. I need a way to exchange routes in between. Yeah, yeah. If you want to have a brownfield environment where you have VMs and containers connecting to each other and things like that, yeah. you might uh, want to use a real routing protocol because, of course, in that case, yeah, that's, that's sure, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> My question's about the DNS server. Um, is it accessible at the API level or plugin level or uh, no. driver um, level? Well, um, the, the, the access to that is really through the service API, right? Um, service API actually provides something called aliases as well. So you can actually alias a particular service uh, to say that, okay, I want to also use a set of aliases for this service name. So that determines you know, all the names that you can use to discover that service. But that's the only way you can actually uh, you know, access the DNS itself. The DNS is not a generic DNS itself, right? I mean, it's just for the discovery of services that we create. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, so I have two small questions. Uh, as you already have secure data plane, does it mean that all traffic going through the VIPs are secure by default? Uh, I didn't understand. get the question. So, again. for example, when uh, a, a service talk to uh, each other, right? They talk through the VIP. Yeah. Does it mean the traffic will be secure over the network, I mean, encrypted by the data plan. Uh, there is a web, but that's just logical. That is imaginary, right? Yeah. There is, yeah, I mean, there is but nothing. But then traffic between the containers going through IPsec, right? Oh, IPsec. Um, no, IPsec is completely different. Right? IPsec actually happens at a very, very low layer, actually, in the, in the, when, the, when, the, when the driver tries to see, seize the packet. <laughs> that's when it basically uses IPsec. So once you do a whip, and then you find out the real backend, you send the packet out on that backend IP, basically, right? So IP, backend IP uh, information is in the forwarding table, and the forwarding table forwards the packet into a particular VXLAN tunnel, and the VXLAN tunnel actually gets encrypted by IPsec at that point. So it's very, at, at the very low level, low level that happens, right? It's not at the VIP level at all. Okay. Uh, so the same question is for the ingress traffic, uh, mm -hmm. the only way for, on this system to do and SSA encryption is to it uh, to do it uh, yourselves, right? Uh, For the, the ingress. In, yeah, okay. the ingress traffic is not encrypted right now, uh, mm -hmm. but um, in, maybe in the future we are going to add you know ways for users to um, provide options for the ingress network. Okay. Once you have options, you could actually secure the ingress network as well, okay. because it uses the same overlay driver and things like that. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I will ask the question that was asked previously uh, in a simpler way because I don't think we got an answer. So if you have uh, service one is in VXLAN one and service two in VXLAN two and they have to talk to each other, service one to service two, can you do that? Uh, do, how, how do you distribute well, I mean, the, 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 the host is, information? Yeah, the uh, recommended way is to make these two services actually be part of the same network. So they are actually part of the same VXLAN. Okay, so, but you run out of subnets and you will increase the broadcast domain to a certain limit. If you have 10,000 containers, you cannot put them all in, in the same VXLAN, right? You realize that you need routing between the two of them. Whether you do it with a regular control plane or not, you need something to distribute the, the host in VXLAN 1 to the host in VXLAN 2. Can you do that or do you mandate the same VXLAN if so they need to talk? Yeah, one network is actually um, um, multiple L2 segments. So you could actually have multiple VXLAN IDs, basically. So when you actually create uh, a network, you know, overlay driver, you could just specify multiple subnets, like you know, 10.1.0.0/16, 10.2.0.16, whatever. So it actually creates multiple VXLAN IDs for each and every subnet. So that's and how it works. They can talk to each other, yeah. right? So um, on the remote driver side, we will get the uh, hooks to place the IPVS namespace into a specific port or something, right? Or because it, it looks like it's pretty static, it's pre-configured and then it's there, but can we move it to something else? Can we move those ports to something else, like yeah, we do yeah. for containers? Yeah, it is possible. I didn't, I didn't have time to talk about it, but um, if you want to actually have your own load balancer, you know, in a user space proxy, uh, or anything like that, you could just do that. Um, just you just need to kind of you know you can you can even use use the Swarm service orchestration layer to actually create that as a service, and then you know either you use a global mode to kind of schedule that in all the nodes, 
or maybe you know just use a normal mode where it gets scheduled in a, a few nodes. So in that mode, actually, you kind of uh, listen on a particular port, like 80 or 443, and then you can do like a layer 7 load balancing. And because they're exposing ports, they are connected to the ingress network. So even if you have um, some service which is actually um, part of the same ingress network, you could just you know drive the engine, like lay the load balancer, but just their service names. So it'll be able to. Uh, I think we are going to talk about, or we're going to write some like real documentation of how to do that. Um, and yeah, it is possible okay. with this model. But the, you don't have that yet in the remote driver, right? So you're targeting that for the next release to be able to send all this information about the service over the uh, remote driver interface? Uh, remote driver interface? Well, the, the REST interface, right? The, what, what you're using to... Uh, no, the service, services are not going to... I mean, it's not part of the driver API. So, I mean, we might have a load, load balancer extension point or something like that. I mean, it's not, it's not even desired or anything like that, but uh, may happen or may not happen, but it's not going to go through the network driver interface because it is a, it is the, the, the purpose of the network driver interface to provide network connectivity, not uh, you know, uh, do load balancing and things like that. If you have a load balancing plugin, we might actually do that in that layer. Mm. Yeah. Got it. OK. Yeah. Right. Hi. Um, so we have a need to run multiple containers over the specific interfaces of a machine, let's say the wired interface versus the wireless. And we've been using not the networking host, but bridging, to, bridging multiple containers to specific Ethernet interfaces. And that works great for wire interface. But as soon as we do it for wireless, bridging doesn't work. And we've tried the namespace, NetNS. And as soon as we do that, there's only a maximum of one container we can run on the wireless interface. So you're trying to, I mean, I'm not able to understand, but you're trying to add the wireless interface into the bridge? Right. And that doesn't work for wireless. It uh, works for wireless. I haven't tried it myself, but um, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know the answer for that. I mean, I, I, I've never tried that myself, actually. Okay. But ideally, it should work, because it's just another interface. Uh, but you know, that may be special. Wireless networks are going to be special, actually. So there's yeah, something. Yeah. There is a deal about max spoofing, and that's why Max snooping? Yeah, max snooping actually always happens. That's what Bridge does, actually. Right. It does snoop MAC addresses and things like that. But, you know, uh, I don't see why it shouldn't, wouldn't work, basically. It doesn't really work. So is there some way we can? We can talk about it offline and see if, if okay. there is a problem or something like that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. There's a long-standing issue with UDP where you have a container listening on a certain port we're sending you, you know, doing UDP traffic. You stop that container, replace it with a new container, same port, different IP, and so contract continues to have those entries, and the engine doesn't clean up the connection tracking for you. Um, uh, that's if, not a huge problem if you're managing, orchestrating everything by hand because you can just add in the contract calls to clean that up. But as soon as you start doing this with Swarm, that's a real problem because you don't have the ability to do that anymore. Can we get this fixed? Uh, I don't know about the exact issue you're talking about, but contract entries should be fi you know, cleared if, if there is a graceful connection shut down, actually, if there's a TCP connection. If it's UDP, of course, it has to wait for another time. Yeah, or whatever, actually. TCP, it, it gets cleaned up automatically yeah. because the, the, the connection, the sockets get closed, so of course, yeah. the kernel automatically cleans mm -hmm. it. But for UDP, the connection tracking only gets cleared when it expires. And yes. I really think the engine should, when you stop the container, should tell contract to drop all those connection tracking. Yeah, I think that's not a bad idea. I mean, we should do that. I, I didn't know that there was an there's issue a, like there's that. There's an issue that's been open uh, for like two years. OK, yeah, so. we should fix that, yeah. So I had a question about, you said you don't use BGP border gateway protocol, but you use this gossip protocol. Is that documented? Is there a? paper that's been published that I could yeah, read? Yeah, there is a paper I can, you know, I think, you know, it, it, you can just Google for SWIM and you will you'll find it. Google what? Uh, I'm sorry. Google SWIM uh, Gossip Protocol, something like that. You will find it. Um, it's SWIM, S-W-I-M, SWIM. SWIM. Yeah. That's the name of the, the, yeah. the Gossip Protocol. Yeah. Okay, thank you. A question um, about the service discovery. So let's say I have two services running, service A and service B. Uh, if the content within the container they run on the same port, port 80 and port 80. When I use a published port, 
does it have to be unique or can I not publish the port where they can find it based on the service name if service name is unique? Uh, no, so, uh, it's, it's, all these things are happening at layer four, so the service name doesn't even come into the picture. Okay. Um, so if you really want to actually like, you know, load balance on, on the same published port across multiple services, you really have to do that uh, in the layer seven level by using the HTTP headers and things like that. Uh, but the load balancing solution that we provide is at the layer four level. So you need to actually either, you need to have a you know, unique port per service. Either you use a demand port or some dynamic port that is allocated. It has to be unique. Um, but you can always like put um, an uh, HTTP load balancer in front of this Windows routing mesh and it will do the job. Uh, that's the way to do it. But in the future, maybe we will actually do some uh, native way of, ways of doing like layers on load balancing. Okay, so yeah. for now, it, the published port has to be unique. Unique, yeah. And you have to publish the ports. Yeah. And if I have multiple instances running across multiple nodes, I have to ensure that they all bind to the same port. Yes. Well, the unique port. If, the, if there are multiple instances of the same service, they are fine because they are going to use the same port, actually. Correct. Okay. Yeah. But if it's across multiple services, that's when the problem comes. That's when you have to actually make sure that the they are service their own, ports are yeah. unique across my application. If I have 10 microservices, they all use unique ports. Correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you have 10 services, you know, that microservices. That need to talk to each other. Uh, Okay. Yeah, they're talking to each other within the east-west network. You don't need to, actually, they can all use the same port, right? The problem only comes when you try to expose that port outside From to the external outside, cluster. From outside, ingress, okay. Yeah. But for internal communication internal between Internal communication, you don't, there is no conflict. You don't need to, need to expose any port. It'll just work. All of the services can listen on the same port. Uh, let's say it's 80, and you have like N services of 80, uh, which are exposed, which are listening on 80. They all can continue to listen on 80. Just, it'll just work because of the service discovery. Got it, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, quick question about scaling, right? So, I mean, the example that you showed, you created a service which had three endpoints created in it? Is that how you did it? What is that? So, so when you showed an example, you created a service, right? Yeah, with the three replica. With, with? Three, rep three, three replicas, three, yeah. 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 And then, um, so how, how the service scaling part works? So let's say I start with three. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to come up with a sort of workflow if, if I need to go from three to 10, what are the kind of steps would I need yeah, to you, do? You know, if you start with three, you could just do a service update and say replicas to 10. Okay. So it'll automatically scale up to 10 replicas, actually. So, so that would create all the networking information? Yeah, you don't right? need to do anything, actually, at all. Uh, once you, when you define the service, whatever you provide, it's not overridden, actually. Uh -huh. Whatever you provide in the update is the one that is changed. Uh -huh. And if you, if you just want to scale your application, you just say, update replicas to something. It will not even bring down the tasks that are running. It will just add more tasks to that, and yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the containers will be sp spun up and connected to those endpoints automatically? Or? Yeah, it will all happen automatically. OK. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks for spending time on Q&A with us. Um, my understanding is the mesh network will do forwarding when, um, when a client comes in and hits, hits a service on a machine that's not running that service. Um, can you give your opinion on um, on the impact of this if we have a low latency requirement, like four or five millisecond response time requirement? Um, yeah, I mean, if latency is, is latency is highly important for you, um, you could actually try to hit the node uh, where the tasks are running, basically, right? Uh, we don't like you know uh, disallow that. You can just do that. Um, that's the simplest way to solve that problem, basically. So if you if you if you do that, then um, you could actually solve the problem. The one real problem still exists is, uh, is that if, you're, if, you're, if your instances actually are still distributed across multiple nodes, you'll still try to load balance across all those nodes. Um, so you might still incur some latency, but we are not exposing, there are a few things that we can do in IPVS to achieve, uh, to, to, to solve that problem. Um, by, there is something called a short, short, shortest expected delay. So you could use that to make sure that your, um, your, your requests are actually being serviced by an instance which is actually supposed to give you the shortest expected delay. So that, that can reduce the latency, basically. Uh, shortest expected delay, where, where would I put that config in? In the networking stack? I know uh, it's not available right now, actually. So that's something that we have to expose in the future. OK. Yeah. OK, yeah, it gave me the idea that I'd need to make our external load balancer aware of where our containers live to keep low latency. Um, but if we don't need low latency, I think this yeah. sounds phenomenal. Yeah. It sounds real cool.
Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that's 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 a that's a different use case, and we, sh we should probably support it actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for your time. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Thanks.